Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the 2021 NOFA Summer Conference. My name is Paul, and I will be the host for this morning's workshop. Uh, before we begin, I have a few announcements to make. First of all, thank you very much to you for coming to our virtual conference again. Um, we'd love to be in place at Hampshire College again this year and seeing all of you in person, but we weren't quite ready to make that step yet. So here we are again for uh, another great virtual conference and we'll hope, hope for uh, in-person winter conferences this year. We are presenting and attending and hosting this workshop from land that was inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to honor those whose land you now occupy. Much of what we know about how to grow food and manage land regeneratively came from farmers of color. NOFA invites you to consider racial equity in your own work. As I mentioned, if we were all in person, this slide would not be necessary, uh, but here we are. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with Zoom by now, but if not, uh, we ask you to mute yourself unless you're speaking uh, for clarity. Uh, feel free to use the chat for questions or comments. Our presenters have asked uh, to have time at the end of the workshop to cover questions. So again, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, our presenters have a lot of great information and wanna make sure they can get through all of it. Um, and then we'll be taking your questions. And a note that this session is being recorded and you all will have access to the workshop uh, shortly after, after the conference is over. We wanna take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors without which uh, this conference would not be possible. Our sponsors help make, uh, help allow us to keep our um, registration fees affordable and accessible to all. Um, we hope that you will consider supporting these sponsors when you have to do your own purchasing. Uh, we think it's great that these uh, businesses and companies want to support NOFA and the great work that we do. So uh, please give them some, some consideration. We also have a great online auction, uh, many great products from some of our sponsors and from others as well that you can bid on. So bid early and bid often. The auction will wrap up at the end of the summer conference. So you have about a week to, to get your bidding in. And finally, if uh, we were in person at that summer conference, one of my favorite things are the, the vendor marketplace that we have. We always have a lot of great and unique vendors and I'm excited to say we have many of those vendors returning in our virtual vendor format. So please feel free to give them uh, a look and support. Uh, many of our sponsors and vendors have um, information in the program book. Uh, they have videos, um, demos, lots of ways that you can check out uh, what's going on through the program book. And now to introduce our speakers. Uh, Christy Bassett is a homesteader from Barrie, Massachusetts in central, central Massachusetts. Um, Christy actually is a NOFA Massachusetts employee. She's our communications director. And normally Christy can be found behind the scenes, kind of making sure things run smoothly and efficiently here at NOFA Massachusetts. But today she is stepping in front of the camera and presenting her first workshop for us with NOFA Massachusetts. So uh, thank you very much, Christy and Sarah Davis. Sarah founded Oak Hollow Livestock with her family in Shelbourne, Massachusetts and has been a, a mentor and resource to Christy um, over the years. So welcome, Sarah. And with that, we look forward to hearing the family cow. So thank you all for coming. Um, we're gonna try to cover as much as we can during the time we have with you. Um, it might be helpful for us to know if you're here and in person and the chat, if you can tell us um, either what your experience level is with cows or what your interest is in this workshop, um, just so we can gear the content a little bit um, towards answering your questions or covering things that you'd like to know about. So either um, if you've had a cow before or you're thinking about it or you just got one or uh, anything special that um, you'd like us to cover, that would be great. So we'll start with a little introduction of us. Thanks for the great intro, Paul. 
Um, I'm Christy. Uh, my homestead farm's name is Barefoot All Natural Farm. We started out actually in Athol, Massachusetts, and we have moved to Barrie, Massachusetts since we started in 2013. Um, shortly after we decided to open up our land to homesteading, um, we got our first family milk cow in 2014. Um, originally, I had studied psychobiology and animal studies, which is basically animal behavior from the University of New England. Um, so I'm definitely an animal person rather than a gardener, and I'm really excited to um, have a focus on livestock here at the NOFA Summer Conference. Um, I also have a small herd of dairy goats and some other livestock on our homestead farm. Um, my first dairy goat and actually introduced an introduction to livestock was from Sarah. Um, so she is certainly my mentor and um, a great resource for us as we move forward. So I'll let you introduce yourself, Sarah. So I am Sarah Davis um, and our farm is Ocala Livestock. And as mentioned, it's in Shelburne, Mass. And we um, have a variety of livestock here. Our main thing that we do is boar goats, but I have a lot of experience with dairy cattle. Um, I grew up on a small dairy farm in Western Mass. We had about 40 milkers. Um, and since then I have had a variety of, of cattle, um, both milking and raised for beef. Um, but generally we have a couple of milking animals on our farm, whether you know it's a dairy cow and jerseys are my personal preference because I grew up with them and um, just find them very endearing and um, just, just really enjoy them and their milk and their personality. Um, and then we generally raise a cross calf, either a Jersey Angus cross or you know an Angus for beef. So um, usually there's a cow on the farm and um, got a lot of experience with cattle and other livestock as well. Um, and then officially I have a degree from UMass and um, so studied animal science there and did a lot of student teaching and outreach in that capacity as well. So uh, I thought it was appropriate to introduce you to the cows that we're going to be featuring throughout the workshop. Um, most of the pictures that you'll see here are from either my cow shine or Sarah's cows that she's had in the recent past. Um, Shine, who you can see here, is a Jersey milking shorthorn cross, and we'll go over the, the breeds in a little while. She's seven right now, so we've had her since she was three months old um, and have had five calves from her so far. Um, she's primarily pastured during the day. We do stall her at night, so we can talk a little more about that setup. Um, and she's currently nursing and calf sharing with her six month old Normandy cross, um, who is the steer that we will eventually raise for beef. Um, and in the past, she's had some Angus cross calves too. Um, like I said, primarily our, on our farm, we've had Jersey cows. Um, this is one of our, our little ones with um, one of our cows and who we have for the last five years or so pretty much always had a milking cow on our farm uh, right now I don't and um, I'm, I'm kind of missing that but taking a little bit of a break and I'm sure that you know that will come back around for us pretty quickly but um, we've had a lot of transition with our farm and moving and so right now we're not milking a cow and I do miss it um, and so that's something that's in the works I think but in the past we've raised crosses of different breeds for beef uh, for our family. And part of what we enjoy about the cows is that they complement our, our boar goat herd quite a bit and using the forage that we have on our farm uh, because cows are more grazing and goats are more browsing. So they work really well together. Um, and so that's been nice for us to be able to manage the forage on our farm a little bit more naturally and in a way that has diversity of livestock. Great. So um, it seems like you're all at least interested in uh, potentially getting a cow or learning what's all, what it's all about. So you may have some inkling into why you might want a dairy cow. Um, some of the things that drew me to it and a lot of people um, to having a family cow, definitely having access to fresh raw milk. 
um, pretty much whenever you want it is a huge bonus. We're lucky in Massachusetts that uh, we are able to purchase raw milk on uh, certified farms. So um, there may be one near you that you can purchase raw milk from, from but typically they're fairly far apart and it takes a little bit of a drive um, to actually get to a raw milk farm to purchase milk. So having your own, especially if you're kind of off the beaten path and not near a raw milk farm is a huge benefit. Um, when you know your cow, you know your milk. So that's another huge thing that drew me to having my own cow. Um, there are certain things that I was looking for in raw milk for my family. Um, I was a little particular about uh, what the cow is eating and the cleanliness of how they were um, cared for, definitely the humane treatment of the animal. So all those things you can actually control when you own the cow. Um, and you know everything about that certain cow. So that's a, another huge benefit. Um, raw milk itself, whether or not you're a proponent, there are some uh, known benefits to raw milk. So one is that uh, not being pasteurized, raw milk uh, contains all the natural enzymes and nutrients that come along with the milk uh, naturally produced by the cow. Pasteurization is heating the milk up to destroy all the bacteria in it, which also destroys some of the good bacteria that your body um, can benefit from. So raw milk is um, typically higher in those nutrients and a little easier to digest. So um, one benefit to having your own cow is that you, you do have the access to the raw milk all the time. Um, uh, cows do produce a lot of milk, so we'll get into exactly how much you might expect from a cow, but it's probably more than you and your family can drink, even if you had a really large family. Um, and like us, we share with our family. Um, so our extended family gets some of our extra milk, but we still can't go through it all. Um, so you do you typically have extra milk that you can use as feed for other animals on the homestead. So, um, Pigs tend to go really well hand in hand with the milk cow. Pigs love milk, they grow really well on it. Milk, um, especially whole raw milk is a complete food. So it contains all of the uh, nutrition that an, an omnivore needs to grow. So um, it's a really great supplement for other omnivores on your farm. Um, keeping pastures clear is also a really great benefit. I think Sarah mentioned this in her introduction, but if you do have a large open space and you are not into mowing it all the time, um, cows do a great job of clearing it and keeping it clear. Uh, if you're going to have a milk cow, it means you're going to be a breeder. Breeder, You're gonna be breeding that animal and potentially having a calf or more than one calf. Um, and that calf can be raised for beef. So you also have um, another source of food for your family. Um, or it can be sold for income. Cows also poop a lot. So <laughs> eating a lot turns into a lot of manure. Um, and that is like gold. It's actually a huge, huge reason that we have had a cow in the past um, to improve our soils and to create um, really nu nutritious uh, compost for our gardens. So that's a, a really great side benefit to a homestead for having a cow. Definitely the bonding and connection is important to animal lovers like myself. Um, spending time with my cow is one of my favorite things. Being able to look out the window and see her grazing and see her babies, um, pretty much the best part of my day. So <laughs> that's another huge benefit to um, having your own dairy cow. There are some considerations that, you know, might you might want to have a cow for certain things, like you might think it will save you money by having your own milk cow. Um, we'll get into how much it costs to own a cow in different situations, but typically you'll be much better off just buying milk if that's the only reason that you'd like to have a cow. Um, it's Cows are typically not kids' animals either, so if you want to get a cow and say it's for my four-year-old son, <laughs> um, they are very large animals. Um, and although they can be very docile and easy to handle if you are uh, working with them all the time, um, 
they are a lot of responsibilities that we do need to have um, adult supervision. Um, and of course, it's it's fun to think about having a cow, but it's great that you all are here and thinking about the long term reality of what goes into actually keeping it. So it's not a novelty. All right, so how much does a cow actually cost? Um, this is going to depend a lot on your situation. So obviously cows uh, cost something as an initial investment. Um, it could be as low as um, $100, $200, $300 if you're buying a calf. Um, typically a full grown heifer, um, which is a cow that hasn't calved yet, um, will be around the $800 to $1,000 range. If you're looking for a registered cow, um, who's maybe in milk or just a really quality cow, it can be around $1,500. Um, and then you also need to think about where is the cow going to sleep? What type of fencing do I need? Other equipment that I need? So all of that goes into your initial investments. The annual cost definitely varies pretty widely. Um, and we actually have a worksheet for you. We'll um, share with you at the end of Thursday's time. Um, that can help you out and figure out exactly how much year to year it might cost you to own the cow, depending on how you want to manage them. But definitely their feed is probably the biggest expense, um, their bedding and also some veterinary care. So a few other things to think about as you're considering, should I actually get a cow? Um, Cows can live over 20 years. So typically the lifespan of a homestead dairy cow is a little longer than a production commercial cow. Um, they're probably not pushing them as much for production if they're a homestead cow. Um, you're paying a little closer attention to them as a, an individual animal rather than as part of a herd. Um, so they, they do tend to live quite a while. Um, production, can vary, again, depending on the line of the cow or the management, but um, I'm told that some cows are still calving into their late teens and um, still producing milk. So I'm hoping that happens for our cow at seven. She's still got a ways to go, hopefully. Um, they are really big. <laughs> we'll go over how big they, the different breeds are, but it's not like a goat who can be dog sized and housed in a small shed or something like that. Um, cows are big and they need a lot of space uh, and shelter that fits their size. They eat a heck of a lot. <laughs> so either you need a lot of pasture or a lot of hay or possibly both. Um, which means that you also need storage space for your hay. Um, and New England cows can graze for uh, six or seven months of the year probably. Um, and the rest of that time, they're gonna need to be eating hay and probably double what they eat in the summer if you're counting on some pasture as feed in the summer. Um, they're also herd animals. So they tend to do well with other cows. Um, when we first started out, we did, did not have other cows. We had goats. So Shine was housed with our dairy goats uh, in the barn in the pasture and they did fine. Um, but it was hard to tell when she was in heat. She wanted to play a little too roughly with them. Um, she could step on them easily. There was just a few things that weren't ideal. Um, and once she had a calf that we ended up keeping, um, she did seem I don't know if happier is the right word, but she seemed more settled and able to act a little more naturally. So it is nice to think about um, having one cow can work. Um, having two cows or more is probably better. Um, the daily time commitment is a big thing. So having a family cow is a lifestyle choice for sure. Um, I typically spend at least an hour and a half each day um, caring for my cow, milking her, um, cleaning up after her and taking care of the milk. So that's just the baseline every day. So probably you're milking twice a day or even if you're only milking once a day, um, it takes time. Uh, and then there's also dealing with all that milk afterwards uh, and doing dishes and all that. 
So think about that, make sure that um, you're ready for that kind of commitments. Um, there's a lot of benefits to it, but you do need to work that into your daily routine. Um, the other thing is that you really are tied to your farm. <laughs> so at least twice a day, whether it's just feeding or if it's milking and feeding, um, they need to have human interaction and attention. So you can't really just go away for the night when you have a, a cow, um, unless you have someone who's back up for you. So thinking about, do I have a farm sitter? Do I have a family member? Do I have a neighbor that I can train and trust to take care of my cow while I'm away? Um, definitely a vet. You wanna make sure that you find a, a livestock veterinarian in your area, which can be a little difficult. Um, some veterinarians are either stocked with clients or trying to retire, or there just hasn't been enough interest in caring for um, homestead animals, so they downsize. So a good place to check um, is with other local farms or people that you know in the area who have livestock um, to get connected with a veterinarian. Just form a good relationship with them before um, it's an emergency and you're calling someone you don't know begging for help. Um, also, as we'll talk about, you do need to think about how you're going to get your cow bred. So in order for a cow to make milk, they need to have a baby. Um, and typically you can have that done through artificial insemination. Um, again, that can be hard to find someone who does that in your area. So um, there'll be some research that goes into figuring out how you can actually get your cow AI'd um, or someone with a bull and how you can arrange that situation. So we'll talk about that a little more in a bit. So now that Christy has convinced you that you need a cow in your life and some things to think about that might make you consider the timing and if you really do need a cow in your life. Um, and I think everybody needs a cow in their life in some way, whether you own a cow or you just visit a cow. Um, but the first question a lot of people have is, you know, okay, so I've decided I want a cow. Where do I get a cow, right? I mean, they're not just in the newspaper. They're not, you know, you can't list, you can't see animals for sale on Facebook anymore. Um, and so there are some things to think about, you know, when you do look for a cow. And Christy mentioned earlier um, that you can buy a cow at different ages. So you could buy a calf that you're going to bottle feed and raise from the very beginning. Um, and there are definitely advantages to that. Um, you'll, you know, that calf will form a very strong attachment to you. You'll do all the handling and training um, and you'll really get to know each other and build that bond. Um, but it's a long time from the time you're bottle feeding a calf to the time you breed her to their gestation, which is very long to the time they calve and you finally get some milk. Um, and so a lot of people prefer to start with a cow that either is pregnant and due to calve very soon. And so they're looking at milk pretty soon or a cow that's already milking um, and doesn't have a calf associated with her. So they can bring her home and have milk that, that night. Um, and so, you know, there are some considerations there about, you know, what type of, you know, how soon you want to have your milk and what type of relationship you want with that cow. Um, you know, not everybody has a very personal relationship with their milking cow. If you get a milking cow from a very big dairy, she may never have had a halter on um, and she may not be used to being handled at all because a lot of those dairies use machines for milking. Um, and if you are looking at a smaller farm that you know maybe does handle their cows every day, then a milking cow might be used to being hand milked and brushed and haltered and all those things that'll make it easy for you, um, you know, as a first time owner to handle that animal and work with that animal. Um, and so there are considerations about the age and also the source of your cow. Um, some of the places that, you know, a lot of people look is social media obviously is right at the top where people, that's the first place we go for everything now, right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, there are sort of sneaky ways that people list animals for sale, but even um, not looking for sale posts, but looking at, you know, local small farms and homesteads near you that raise cows. Um, for dairy, you know, you can find those really easily through networking on social media. Um, and, and I would emphasize that, you know, if you're looking at getting a cow that's already, you know, either you know, a mature cow or, you know, even an older, older calf, um, that the smaller farms are going to tend to be places where the animal's been handled. And so a lot of times um, your 4-H kids 
there's a lot of 4-H kids that work with dairy cows. Um, and so a lot of times they'll have cows that are available as their kids age out of doing 4-H um, or they are connected to other people who may have animals available that really have been handled a lot and are very friendly and very calm and easygoing. Um, you can certainly look in different online and print magazines like Country Folks is one that I think of that has a lot of dairy ads. Um, you know, it is a little bit more geared, I think, towards bigger dairy, but, you know, you may be able to find some dairy farms to talk with and, and learn a little bit about cows and what they might have available. Um, and then breed associations. And once, if you pick a breed that you just fall in love with um, and you decide that, you know, I, you know, for me, that's Jersey's because that's, <laughs> they've got my heart as far as dairy cows go. Um, and so each, each uh, breed has their own association website and most of them have breeder lists on there and you can find folks that are close to you. Um, and if you're looking at getting a heritage breed, the Livestock Conservancy has a breeder listing as well. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about breeds later and what that means to be a heritage breed versus, you know, a more, um, modern breed and what those differences are. But one play, there's a couple of things too. Um, like Craigslist is one of those resources that's out there and you have to be really careful and really, you know, aware of who's listing that animal. You know, there are scams out there and there are people who are selling animals that aren't necessarily in the best health. Um, and so I would definitely recommend bringing someone with you when you go look at your cow. Um, so that someone who knows what a cow that's healthy and well taken care of looks like is with you to help you vet that that animal and that environment. Um, one thing I would say is when you are looking for a cow, almost the most important thing is where not to get your cow. And I hear a lot of stories of people who buy a cow from the local livestock auction. And those cows are there for a reason. Um, and those livestock auctions really are terminal auctions. Those animals are not intended to come back onto a farm and those animals a lot of times have been exposed to or are infected with different diseases that um, you know, can be something that is a consideration both for their health but also any other animals you might have at home. And some diseases can be potentially zoonotic to people. So um, I would really, really strongly caution you not to go to the livestock auction and have your heart buy a cow that is not healthy and not gonna be a good long-term investment for you. Um, a couple of things is, we talked about a little bit about temperament and handling I, and- I went to Walmart and I went to- um, uh, I talked a little bit about temperament and handling, but you know, really handle the cow that you are interested in. You know, if she's in milk, then ask if you can milk her and make sure that that's something that you can do and that she's used to hand milking and you know is a relationship that's going to be really workable for both you and the cow um, you know look at overall health you know is the animal in good good condition is she really skinny is she really overweight um, really overweight cows may not breed or calve easily may not milk very much um, so sometimes there's a reason they're overweight beyond just you know having free access to food um, you know, take a look at, you know, how their manure looks. If they have diarrhea, that's something you want to notice while you're there looking at your cow that you're potentially buying. Um, you know, take a look at the rest of the cows that are in that environment and make sure they all look healthy and clean and shiny. And, and I say clean, I mean, cows are, um, cows are big animals. They make a lot of manure. They're heavy. They can make a lot of mud. So with the rain that we've had for the last month, if you were to go look at a cow right now that's in any sort of pasture situation, there's probably gonna be mud on the cow. Um, but there's a difference between a cow that's walking through mud and a cow that's living in mud up to its knees. Um, and so, you know, really just take a time to look in the environment and make sure that that's an animal that's coming from a healthy environment that's gonna to continue to be healthy and productive for your needs. Um, you, know, there, you can ask about calving history. So if it's a mature cow who's had babies, you know, has she had any problems that might indicate that maybe she's not a good candidate for you if you don't feel comfortable, um, you know, managing that challenge. And ask about, you know, her milk production if it's a cow that's in milk. You know, is she a five gallon a day milker? Or is she a two gallon a day milker? And, um, you know, any, any medical issues she may have had in the past that maybe you should be aware of. Um, you can ask about diseases and you can look for signs of certain diseases like respiratory diseases. Um, you may notice some 
eye or nasal discharge that would indicate that calf or cow may not be healthy um, at that time. And there's some testing that you can do for different diseases, um, like Yoni's is one that is very present in more of your commercial dairies a lot of the time, um, but even small farms a lot of times will end up with it and not even realize it. And that's something that you can do a blood test for if it's you know, a cow that you feel like you might wanna take home, it might be worth making that, that investment. And generally testing is fairly inexpensive. Um, and you can look for you know, her utter texture and size of any previous mastitis or damage on a cow that's milking. Um, look at how small or big her teats are. Um, one thing that people, most people, most homesteaders are hand milking and hand milking a cow whose teats are really, really tiny is going to be exhausting. Uh, milking a cow who has teats that are big enough that you can milk her comfortably is really, really important for a cow you're going to be milking twice a day. Um, you can ask for testing on the milk. Um, a lot of the larger dairies do somatic cell counts, which essentially tells you how much sort of not so good bacteria is in the milk and potentially um, can tell you if there's any subclinical mastitis going on. And your smaller folks may not have those test results, but dairies that are you know, putting milk in their bulk tank have to have those results. And so that's something to maybe ask about. Um, you can ask about any vaccinations the cow has had. Um, a lot of folks vaccinate their cows for rabies, a lot of small farms. Um, I think that it's probably a prudent thing to do. Cows can get rabies and they have sort of atypical symptoms compared to other animals we think of getting rabies. And so it's, it's sort of something that has very few side effects and is probably worth vaccinating if you just have a cow or two at home. Um, you can vaccinate for respiratory diseases and a lot of the bigger farms do, um, partly because they have so many cows going in and out so frequently that there's a lot more chance of having respiratory diseases. And for a small farm that only has a couple of cows and they're just selling the calf that they produced this year, it may not be a big deal because they're in a different environment. And so taking into consideration the risk of the calf that, or the cow that you're looking at is, is gonna be really important. And um, planning ahead is gonna be something that's <laughs> gonna be something you need to do. Um, like Christy mentioned, um, cows are, are pretty big. Uh, you can't just stick them in the back of your minivan and bring them home most of the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it done. I, I may have done it once or twice and taken a, a bottle calf home in the back of my van, but um, in general, you need a trailer to get a cow home. And so you either need to own a trailer or have a friend who wants to let you borrow their trailer, or you have to find someone who hauls that animal for you. Um, and so you need a plan for how am I going to get this animal to my location? And do I have my setup for them already? Um, and talking to some some folks that raise cows that may have cows available, they may not have anything available today, but in six months they might have a cow for you. And so, you know, keep your time frame in mind, and it may help to plan a little bit further ahead than, um, than just doing an impulse buy of a cow, which I would definitely say is a bad idea under all circumstances. Um, <laughs> it's a big, long-lived animal, so planning ahead is very important. So here's a slide of the seven most common dairy breeds of cows. Um, since this is a dairy cow workshop, we'll focus on these, but we'll also touch on some other types of cows that you might see out there or consider as a crossbreed or um, to breed to your cow for future calves. Um, so up on the top left, you'll see Ayrshire. I know there's, I'm sure there's other ways to pronounce that. <laughs> um, this is a, an average sized cow. Um, they're known for average production, kind of a good quality milk. They tend to be pretty hardy and adaptable. So they um, have a pretty strong following here in New England, although they're not as common as some of the others. Brown Swiss, um, one of the largest cows, you typically will see these on uh, dairy farms that are making cheese or producing milk um, in commercial volumes. They're about 1,500 pounds, so about as big as a cow gets. Um, their milk is known to be really high in protein, but they are uh, sort of gentle giants. They're pretty docile cows. Guernseys, um, they, their milk is known to be kind of a golden color, so some people will call them golden Guernseys. 
Um, their milk is really high in beta carotene just because of the way that they process um, their feed and uh, what gets carried through into the milk. Um, about 1,100 pounds, um, so a little on the smaller side, but still a good sized cow, um, known to be pretty gentle also. Then at the bottom, uh, there's a red and white and also a Holstein. They're actually both Holsteins, but they've been separated into the red and white color and the black and white color. Um, the black and white Holstein is the one that we're probably all familiar with on the side of a milk carton. Um, most common dairy cow for high production. Um, they are humongous, <laughs> about 1,500 pounds, uh, if not a little more. Their milk tends to be pretty low in fat. So because they are such high producers, um, they have a lot of volume, but not always a lot of butter fat in their milk. Um, and now red and white has been sort of recently focused on as um, breeding to create more of that color. They aren't quite as far along into the production breeding as the black and white Holstein. So um, similar, but maybe not as high production as the black and white. Jersey, um, Sarah mentioned, and also my cow is half Jersey. Um, it's the smallest of these breeds. So around a thousand pounds, give or take. Um, so a little more manageable size for a homestead. Their milk is also really high in butter fat. So if you're thinking about using the milk for cream, ice cream, whipped cream, sour cream, cream cheese, butter, all those things that um, you want to do with milk, uh, Jersey's is a, a nice choice for that. They tend not to be the best cow for a full cheese operation, um, just because the fat is it's different than uh, what you would want in a milk for cheese, but it can still be used for sure. Uh, milking shorthorn, that's the other half of what my cow is. Um, it's a, a nice dual purpose breed, so they may not have as much milk production as these others, um, but still a good producer. They're around 12 or 1300 pounds, so a little bit bigger. Um, but they tend to have a little more flesh on them. So if you're thinking about dual purpose for a milk and for beef, um, it's a nice cross for a homestead. Um, I don't think we have pictures of beef breeds in here, but a whole bunch of different options. Um, I think Sarah and I have both bred to Black Angus for sires for our calves. Um, a Black Angus or even a Red Angus, a smaller breed of a beef cow. Um, so if you have a Jersey or a smaller homestead milk cow, that's a nice thing to cross with because the cows will be a little bit smaller than if you were to breed to something um, really big like a Charlet or a Cemento. Um, other kinds of beef cows out there, um, Herefords, uh, Felt Galloway, Highlands, um, there's a whole lot of breeds out there that you can look into and probably a good idea to get a feel for their temperament and their size and what might mesh well with your goals for the calf that you're, you're breeding for. Um, cross breeds are also great. Like I mentioned, my, my cow is a cross breed. Um, you can get something called hybrid vigor when you cross two purebreds, which means that you get a calf that's even bigger than either of their parents or healthier, you just get a nice cross of genetics that way. Um, so if you're looking at a uh, dual purpose family milk cow, um, you might want to look at something like a Jersey Angus cross or something along those lines. Um, there are also heritage breeds out there. So if you're interested in preserving a breed that um, has served humans well uh, in the long lived past, there are definitely breeds out there that might um, be really fun for you and also a good thing to work on for preservation for that breed. Um, actually, Sarah, did you want to talk about any heritage breeds? I think you have a little experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. So heritage breeds, one thing with the a lot of the breeds that um, are classified as heritage breeds is that they haven't been selected as much for super high production and can make really good homestead cattle. Um, a lot of times they're more of a land race breed, which means they're developed in the area where they're found. And so they're almost more adapted to that area and can be lower maintenance and just a little bit more 
um, suited to a lower input and more homestead type situation. And so I would definitely recommend looking into a heritage breed. Um, and there are some that, a lot of the heritage breeds are dual purpose or, or sometimes even like the Randall Linebacks is one breed that I like particularly. And they're actually what's considered a triple purpose breed. So they historically they've been used for meat, milk and draft. Um, and so they're very versatile and, but there's other breeds like your Dexter cattle are a smaller, um, sort of dual purpose breed that can work a lot or that work well on a lot of different homesteads, um, or crosses of different more heritage breeds can give you an animal that doesn't need to be fed quite as much. Um, and doesn't produce quite the quantity of milk and sometimes just fits really well with the homestead. So definitely something I would recommend looking into and, um, and considering as, as you think about a cow. Um, they can be a little bit harder to find sometimes, um, but if you have the opportunity, sometimes it's worth taking a look and seeing what you can find locally. So thinking about how much space you actually need um, on your homestead, uh, that can vary quite a bit. Um, our original home, we had about seven acres and about one acre was fenced in and it had been woods that we cleared. So definitely not a full grass pasture, probably not ideal for a cow, um, but we made it work and um, she had room enough to get some exercise. Um, and also do a little bit of browsing. Um, so when you think about your pasture, you wanna think about what type of fencing you want. Um, you can see in the background of this photo of our old uh, property, we just had a three slat wood fence. Uh, it went up about four feet. Uh, cows typically are not huge jumpers, although they can be if there's something they want on the other side of the fence. Uh, we also had a strand of electric wire on the inside there. So it just encouraged her not to rub on the fence or push on it. Just leave the fence alone. <laughs> um, so it's a nice way to um, make sure that your cow respects that fence as a boundary. There are other options for fencing. Um, so Portable electric fence is really great if you're going to be doing rotational grazing or you want to change the area where you have your cow out each day or every so often. Um, you can use poly wire, there's poly tape, there's um, what's the, the kind you use, Sarah? What's that called? Oh, the electronet fencing. It's electronet. like electric mesh net, yeah. Yeah, so typically those, those lightweight electric fencing um, is really nice if you're able to have the space to move your pasture around. Um, but do think about how you're gonna get electric to wherever the cow is going to be. So um, in our case, in this area, it was a, a stable pasture that stayed there. It was connected to our barn. So we had electric right there. Um, currently we use a solar charger for our electric fence. So that's pretty popular that uh, if you're going to be moving the cow around, you can have a solar charger that's not near an electricity source. Um, but also think about how you're going to power that and how strong of an electric fence that you want. So some cows will respect a very light electric shock. Some cows need something a little bit stronger. Also, if you're going to be having other animals in the pasture with the cow, um, like Sarah and I will sometimes pasture our goats with their cows. Um, goats need a lot stronger fencing and they're a lot smaller. So you do need to uh, think about the lowest common denominator. <laughs> so fence to the goats and your cows should respect it as well. Um, hay storage is a big thing. So like I mentioned earlier, um, you're going to have to feed this cow year round. So my cow eats uh, about a bale of hay in the summer each day. In the winter, it's more like a bale and a half because she doesn't have any pasture. Um, so that works out to a heck of a lot of hay. <laughs> so you need a heck of a lot of space. You can get hay delivered throughout the year, typically, if you find a good source for it. Um, but then you also have to pay for um, trucking and delivery and hope that they have hay when you need it in the winter. So it's, uh, it's 
probably better to get your hay in the summer. Typically it's made, um, you can find local hay. We use a family members hay field to source our hay from. Um, and that typically happens early June um, through late September, give or take a little bit, depending on the weather. Um, this year, it's been really hard to get hay in because of all the rain. So um, I imagine hay is going to be pretty pricey this year um, and potentially hard to find too. So occasionally people will uh, get hay sourced from other areas too. And weather has not been great anywhere this year. So either too hot or too wet. Um, so I do imagine that prices are gonna be high and hay is gonna be hard to find. So we'll be stocking up as much as we can. Um, we have a hay loft on top of the barn where our, our cows are housed now. Um, so that's a, a good option if you have a typical barn. If you don't, you could use um, a shed or a garage or a something with a portable top. You do need to be careful about it being on the ground or getting wet. Um, hay that gets moldy or mildewy um, is not good for anybody, not good for your cow. So you wanna make sure that you keep that hay uh, dry and off the ground. Um, you'll also need to think about uh, what actual shelter your cow is gonna have. So again, cows are big. They need a place where they can get out of the wind and the rain. Um, you may see beef cows out in the pasture with trees as their only shelter, or you may see a three-sided um, run-in, and that could do. <laughs> Sarah and I talked about this a little bit. You know, it depends on your your frame of thinking of what's acceptable shelter. Um, for a dairy cow, you really don't want them to be challenging their body to stay warm or dry or um, and spend any extra energy than needed. Uh, they should be spending their energy on eating and making milk or growing a baby because they are typically bred also. Um, so they, their body is under a fair amount of stress all the time just because we're putting demands on it. So they should have clean, dry shelter. Um, Typically dairy breeds are a little bit more sensitive to cold and wet than other breeds like beef breeds as well. They don't, typically don't have as much fat. Um, they have a delicate udder. They have a little bit um, more of a, let's say a sissy attitude. <laughs> so, um, you know, they typically don't mind getting a little wet, but my cow does not like being out in the rain and she'll stand at the barn and moo and <laughs> she'll, she'll want to be, um, dry and comfortable. So that's something th to think about. Um, some people will lock their cows in at night. Um, some people just give them the option to go in or out as needed. So that, that can be up to you, but think about um, what kind of threats might be out there and if they're safe um, out in the pasture, if you're gonna give them that option too. Um, once your cow calves and you have a calf, we'll talk about your options for how to raise that calf or what to do with it. But you also need to think about um, a place to separate that calf. Typically you're gonna want to separate the cow and calf either to bottle raise the calf or to separate them for a period of time so that um, your cow can make some milk for you and you can milk them out before they get back together again um, because calves will probably drink all the milk that your cow makes, although it's what, much too much for them. <laughs> Dairy cows make a lot of milk and more than one calf needs. Um, so thinking about a space where you can also have your calf, if you're going to keep it for um, very long, you could just sell it right away after they've had the colostrum, but you're going to be doubling your numbers um, once your cow calves. Um, also think about the manure and compost area. So like I said, cows eat a lot, they poop a lot. You need a space to put all that poop. <laughs> if you have a pasture and you're doing rotational grazing, you may not need to worry about picking it up. It'll just um, biodegrade and sort of naturally turn in. But if you're doing any sort of stall area or taking them in and milking them in a stanchion, um, you're gonna have a buildup of manure, even if it's not a lot. So think about where you're gonna put that how far away it is from where um, you're gonna be collecting it and how you're gonna move it and turn the compost pile as well. Um, 
and definitely need, need access to clean water while your, your cow is out or inside. Water all the time. I'm sure Sarah will touch on this as well, but water, water, water. If your cow runs out of water, they can't make any more milk. Their body gets stressed. Not a good situation. So um, where are you going to have water? Um, is there running water? Is there a hose? Is there a bulk tank that you can fill with water? Or uh, is there a natural spring that's clean and safe for them to drink from? Um, all those are important things to consider. So talking a little bit more about nutrition, um, Christy mentioned pasture and hay and really planning ahead because you, if you get a cow, you have an animal that's going to eat a lot of food. Um, and so you have to make a plan for that. Um, a cow can eat 25 to 40 pounds per day of hay. Um, and the more milk she's making, the more she's going to eat. And so like Christy said, that could be a bale or a bale and a half of hay a day. Um, the bigger cows are probably going to eat more. Um, that said, for their weight, jerseys actually eat a little bit more than some of the bigger breeds per weight. Um, and there's, there's trade-offs there because of the higher fat, but, um, you know, it is a significant amount of feed and you can reduce a little bit of that feed cost by having pasture, um, but they're still going to eat a lot of feed <laughs> and you're going to have a lot of hay storage to do. Um, and so one of the things to look at is, you know, if you have pasture, what is the quality of the grass that's on it? Um, you know, if it's a weedy sort of overgrown area, your cow may not really get much off of it and you may be feeding her just as much as you would if she had no pasture at all, but she'll have something to do during the day and walk around. Um, versus if you have a pasture that, you know, is, has been improved and is really palatable to the cow and provides a lot of nutrition, she may not need as much hay during the summer. And so those are things to consider. Um, you know, when you buy your hay, there's different ways you can get hay. Um, most small homesteaders use small square bales. Um, they're small enough you can pick them up. They usually weigh between 30 and 50 pounds. Um, and they're pretty easy to stack and move around. They usually have two strings on them that work well as handles. Um, a lot of folks that have cows use round bales. You need a tractor to move them or you, you know, I've seen people do them one or two at a time in the back of their pickup and roll them off and then they just sit there until they're gone. Um, because once they're out, you can't really move them. Um, and it's a lot of feed. It can be less expensive to do round bales, but handling is definitely more challenging. Um, and if the hay gets wet, um, the cows may not eat it. And so it may have more waste than your small square bales. Um, when you're looking at hay, there's different things to consider. Um, just like pasture can be different qualities, hay can be different quality. Um, some farmers that mow hay are really good about knowing what needs to go in their field and providing proper fertilization and minerals and cutting at the right time and baling their hay when it's the perfect dryness. And some farmers just want to get the grass off their field and aren't really that worried about it. Um, the upside is cows can eat a lot of feed that a lot of other livestock isn't really gonna eat well. Um, they're not as picky. Um, if it fits in their mouth, most cows will eat it. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you can feed a lower quality of hay to a cow than, you know, for example, a dairy goat, um, but you have to make up the difference in their other nutrition. Um, and so it'll be a lot of bulk, uh, where if you can find a better quality of hay, you can be more forage based with your cow, uh, which is overall generally healthier for the cow and for you drinking the milk that they're producing. Um, there's different types of hay. There's, tip, there's generally like a, what people call a meadow grass hay, which is sort of your native grasses. Um, and a little bit sort of better quality than that is when it's planted with something like Timothy or orchard grass um, or bluegrass, those sort of things um, generally improve the overall quality of the hay, the amount of nutrition that's in it. Um, and then additionally, you can sort of up the protein and the energy content if there is clover or alfalfa um, or other things that sort of pull in nitrogen from the, from the air into the soil and they build up a lot of protein within their leaf structure. And so those things can make your hay really excellent quality. And um, in some circumstances, it could be good enough that you don't need a concentrated feed at all depending on your cow and her level of production and the quality of hay. Um, and the only way to really know, I mean, you can look at hay and see that it's green and fresh, but the only way to really know what's in there is to have it tested. And I would definitely recommend testing your hay if you're gonna buy a big batch of hay from one place or asking if they have testing if you're buying hay. 
um, because that'll help you know what's in the hay and what deficiencies there might be for your cow as she's producing. Um, there's also the option of fermented feed. Most bigger dairies use a fermented feed, whether it's silage or haylage or um, a total mixed ration that includes a fermented feed. Um, fermented feed is very palatable for cattle. Um, it can be an excellent choice, but if you have one or two cows, you probably won't go through it fast enough for it to not spoil before they eat it. Um, so generally homesteaders aren't working with fermented forages and feeds just because of spoilage issues more than anything. Um, so if your hay is not that, you know, beautiful, perfect hay that can really sustain your cow, um, you're going to probably have to add in some sort of concentrated ration. Um, most modern dairy breeds really need additional concentrate input. They've been selected for extreme dairy production. Um, you know, if you look at a beef cow, they might produce a gallon or a gallon and a half a day. Um, if you look at a Holstein, you might be up five or six or more pound, gallons of milk per day from one cow. Um, and so she's really going to need some extra energy and protein to produce that amount of milk. It's a lot of work to make milk and it takes a lot of energy from the animal. Um, and so there's different options. The easiest is a premix ration. Um, there are some pretty good organic options locally. Uh, Morrison's and North Country Organics are two that I think of right off the top of my head that are generally readily available um, and generally have everything your cow needs right in that pellet or that um, whole grain mixture. And it includes a mineral mix and it's balanced for your cow to balance the hay that you're feeding her. So that, that's the simplest option, um, you know, if you just want something out of the box. Um, a lot of folks like to hand mix their feed and know the components that their cow is getting and sort of, you know, if your cow maybe doesn't need as much protein but needs a little more energy and she's not holding her condition as well, you can sort of tweak that a little bit and, you know, add a little bit more of one thing and a little bit less of something else and really come out with something that is more tuned to your cow. Um, but you have to make sure that you're still meeting all of your cow's needs because sometimes when we hand mix things, you know, if we don't have a nutrition degree, you can forget that, you know, maybe she's not getting enough copper or there's not enough selenium or things like that, that might be really important to her overall health. Um, and if they're not getting enough energy or protein, whether it's through their forage or their concentrate, their production is going to go down. Um, they may not hold condition, so they may get thin. Um, and not be as productive and overall as healthy. And so nutrition is really important. <laughs> I would say the most important thing when you have an animal that's producing at the level of most dairy cattle. Um, minerals are something that should be available. They're in a, in a premix, they're gonna be mixed to some degree within the ration. But you also, in addition to that, want to have a mineral mixture that's formulated for cattle available all the time. Um, you can get it in different forms. Um, a loose mineral is, you know, easy to just kind of throw a little scoop out and have them eat it as they want it. Most people with cattle use a solid mineral block and they'll come over and lick it. Um, and those are very effective. You do have to keep them out of the weather or they'll melt. <laughs> um, there's a lot of salt in them, so they'll soak up moisture um, and they can create a mess. So just some thought about where you want to put your mineral. Generally, the best place is right near your water because then they will visit it more often. And water, like Christy said, they drink a lot of water. Um, a milking cow could drink 40 to 50 gallons of water, sometimes more every day, um, depending on the breed. And so they want fresh, clean water in the summer. You know, it shouldn't be sitting in the sun in a black tub and be hot. You want something that they're going to be really enticed to drink because the more they drink, the healthier they will be and the more they will milk. So water, water, water. <laughs> it's very important. Um, talking about pasture, um, you know, you think of cows in scenic New England, and I think most of us picture cows on pasture in green grass, and um, arguably that is the best way to have cattle, um, partly because they do eat so much, and feed is really expensive, and if you can bring the cows to the feed, it will cost you less money than bringing the feed to the cows. Um, a cow will need about an acre and a half to two acres to meet her nutritional needs in most cases. Um, obviously that depends on the quality and quantity of the forage on your acreage. Um, but, you know, a lot of the times it is less expensive to improve your pasture than it is to feed more feed. 
Um, so that's a consideration if you want to have cows and you have a pasture that's maybe not great, but you could improve it with some overseeding or some lime or, you know, some manure application or something like that that might produce more feed the following year. Um, cows on pasture are cleaner. They're not laying in their own manure most of the time. Uh, <laughs> sometimes they're not picky about where they lay down, but if they're in a, a stall, they're going to be going to the bathroom in there the whole time they're in there and they will lay in it. Um, it will end up on their udder and it will end up on their face and it will end up places that it doesn't make sense uh, because they're cows. And so if they're on pasture, they have more space and they will be cleaner, which will lead them to be healthier. Um, you'll reduce your risk of mastitis, which is an infection in the udder. Um, if a cow is in an environment where it's not clean, she's gonna be more likely to get an infection in her udder because cow's udders obviously are near the ground. And when they lay down, their udder lays on the ground. So whatever's there, they put their udder right into it. And milk is an excellent environment for bacteria to flourish. So um, that's something that is a real big benefit of having pasture for your cow is that she it will be cleaner and less likely to get mastitis. And you'll be picking up less manure from her stall. So that is a huge bonus too. Um, one of the things that if you can do it, I strongly recommend is implementing some form of rotational grazing. And we could have hours long seminars on just rotational grazing. There are so many things to talk about, but the basics of it is when you divide the area that you have for grazing into smaller paddocks, and then you move the animal through the paddock so that they graze in one area until it's to the point where, you know, it's four or five inches tall, and then you move them to the next area. And now they're only grazing that, the area they were in previously has a chance to regrow. Um, and so there's a lot of benefits to rotational grazing. Um, you're improving your soil health when you do it because the manure is gonna be applied more evenly to the whole pasture. Um, if you give a cow two acres, they're gonna hang out in one corner. They're gonna poop in one corner, they're gonna sleep in one corner, and they're gonna graze within 20 or 30 feet of that corner. The rest of the pasture is gonna get really overgrown where if you can split it up, now you've sort of forced them to use the whole thing. Um, and they'll get more feed off of it because they'll take the feed that is in those areas they might not have visited as much because they're further from the water or the barn or whatever it is they want to be close to. Um, and also as you rotationally graze, the productivity of your soil is going to be higher. And so you're going to get more forage per acre. And so it'll actually end up saving you even more money over time if you're rotationally grazing. Um, rotationally grazing prevents a cow, like I said, from undergrazing certain areas and overgrazing other areas. And it also can break the internal parasite life cycle. So cattle are grazing animals and grazing animals are host to internal parasites. Um, and cows aren't generally too affected by internal parasites compared to a lot of other grazing animals. Um, but if you are breaking that parasite life cycle, then you don't need to be treating your cows for parasites because they're not having any negative impact from them. So, um, you know, as we're looking at raising cows, a healthier cow is going to, you know, live longer and be more productive and be healthier and happier overall. Um, one thing when you're looking at your pasture that you're considering using for a cow um, is you probably want to take an inventory of poisonous plants. And there are some really good websites um, in the resource list that you'll get at the end. I put one in there for the Cornell uh, poisonous plant list. It's a really good list. They've got pictures and sort of descriptions of different plants that you might find locally. Um, the biggest ones that tend to get us in this area are things like Japanese yew, which usually is an ornamental. Um, usually they get poisoned because someone takes some yard clippings and throws them in a pasture, um, but they're extremely, extremely toxic to cattle. Um, rhododendron and mountain laurel are in the same family. Um, with each other and they're also pretty toxic and uh, mountain laurel grows wild in this area. So if you have areas that are a little wetter and kind of shady, you probably have mountain laurel. Um, and so you'll want to make sure your cows aren't in that area. Um, and there's other things too um, locally that can be an issue, including, you know, even acorns, you know, in quantity, they have a very high tannin content and can be toxic to cattle. And so, you know, as you're planting your pasture, it's definitely worth considering. Um, some of the poisonous plants are teratogenic, which means they cause birth defects, especially in the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, and so, you know, it's really, really important both for the health of your cow and the health of your calf to just make sure that your cows are not in an area with poisonous plants and also to make sure they have enough feed. Most poisoning 
cases with livestock is because they're getting low on feed and they're hungry. And so they go sampling things that they normally wouldn't eat. Um, and so making sure they have enough feed is a, a big preventative measure for preventing poisoning as well from, from toxic plants. Um, and then I have um, a note as well that, you know, when you move a cow to pasture, just to be aware of different issues that can come with pasture. So um, in the spring, when the grass is growing really fast, it's got a lot of water in it um, and the magnesium levels can be off. And so you can get something called grass tetany if they are getting, you know, if you take them in from your barn where they have hay and everything's balanced perfectly and you throw them out on pasture and stop giving them hay one day, and now all of a sudden they're making up their whole diet of grass, they may actually have grass tetany or bloat um, that could be severely life-threatening for them. So any feed changes should be gradual. Um, and just, you know, if you're watching your cow, you'll see, you know, what she needs a lot of the time, you know, and making sure they have hay available either at night or all the time, even in addition to pasture that's not necessarily as productive is generally a good idea to help them balance things out. Um, and like Christy mentioned, usually in the Northeast, our grazing season is around six months, maybe seven. Um, you can plant forages that allow you to do extended season grazing. Um, one thing that people use a lot is turnips um, and field peas and different cover crops that, you know, you may be able to get your cow out and grazing in November and even December, depending on the weather. Um, but Again, I wouldn't necessarily count on not needing the hay for that, but it might help stretch out your hay supply. Um, and so definitely worth considering if you have the space for those things because it can you know, cut your hay cost in half or maybe even more than that and can be a huge savings and also improve the health of your cow. So health means we all want our cows to be healthy, right? <laughs> Nobody wants a sick cow. That's a lot of animal to be sick. Um, and so you want to get to know your veterinarian, um, you know, have your vet out to do your vaccines and get to know your cow a little bit, um, especially the first year or two you have your cow. It's a really good idea to have your vet come out and, you know, check and make sure she's healthy, make sure that, you know, your nutrition program is working well and that she's not losing weight or getting too fat. Um, and just have a good working relationship so that if there's an emergency, you can call them and they will make time for you because most vets will not take you as a new patient in an emergency situation because they're, they have a lot of other clients um, and lives even maybe. <laughs> um, so just be respectful of that and, and really try to build a relationship with your veterinarian. Um, make sure that your cow is getting good preventative care. So that may include your vaccines. Um, and also in your barn, you wanna make sure you have really good ventilation. Uh, make sure that your barn is dry and you, know, you don't have any pooling water or you know, sort of dampness in your bedding in your barn and that'll help your cow stay healthy. Um, the biggest thing for maintaining your cow's health is good nutrition and good water access and good ventilation. Those are the top three things I would say that'll keep your cow healthy. Um, but you'll get to know your cow and you'll get to know when she's not acting right. If she, you know, you let her into milk her in the morning and all of a sudden there's no milk, <laughs> that's a big problem. Um, a lot of times, you know, that's tied back to um, either hypocalcemia, which is when the cow doesn't have enough calcium, um, or some other nutritional issue. All of a sudden, your cow overnight, it will seem like has no milk. Um, or, you know, if she doesn't eat, um, cows are good eaters. And if all of a sudden your cow is not interested in eating, there's probably something going on. Um, when I would always recommend, you know, taking your cow's temperature. If anything doesn't seem right, take your cow's temperature because um, that's going to be the first question your vet's going to ask you is does she have a fever or does she have a subnormal temperature? And that'll give a good hint as to what's going on. Um, you can check for things like feel the utter texture and um, quality, check the milk and see, you know, is there mastitis starting? Does she have some you know, damage to her udder? Did she scratch it on something when she was out in the pasture? Um, you know, is there an injury that needs to be addressed? Um, you can sometimes end up with little bald spots on your cow. And generally those are caused by ringworm. It's like a little round, perfectly round hairless spot. And a lot of times it'll have some crustiness to it and be a little red at the edges. Um, and cows can get ringworm. It's not actually a parasite. It's actually a fungal infection. 
and it is transmissible to people. So if your cow has ringworm, don't touch it. Um, <laughs> you can get it, it's not pleasant. Um, and there's really not a lot you can do for it other than wait for it to go away. You can put some antifungals on it um, with gloves and sometimes that'll help. Um, but generally it's self-limiting, but it is something to be aware of. Um, you know, you wanna monitor your cow for parasites. So I was talking about grazing and internal parasites. And, you know, if your cow develops diarrhea or your cow um, starts to lose weight really for no reason, or just seems not as thrifty or isn't shedding out her winter coat like she usually does, parasites would be something I would consider. And you can get a fecal analysis done um, through your veterinarian and know what type of parasites to be treating for. And they should be able to advise you on how to treat if you need to. Um, there are treatments that are approved for organic uh, milk production. Um, and so that's something to consider. And I think it's worthwhile to make a plan for any sort of injury or infection that could happen with your cow, especially, you know, in organic production, there are a lot of antibiotics that are limited for treatment. Um, and so I think that it's important to have a plan before you're in an emergency situation about how you're going to handle that situation if it were to come up. Um, and then again, nutrition, <laughs> um, you're going to want to adjust your nutrition for the stage of your cow's production. Um, you know, if your cow is at the end of her lactation and you start to dry her off so that you're not going to be milking her for a little while before she has her next calf, she's not going to need nearly the amount of protein and energy as she would need in the first two months of lactation when she can't meet her energy demands, no matter how much she eats. So uh, being aware of those changes and differences is important and adjusting so that your cow doesn't get either over or underweight is extremely important. Some cows might need their hooves trimmed, uh, especially as they age and depending on what type of footing they have and what type of, um, you know, system they're kept in. If they're in really soft bedding or, you know, you're lucky and have an area that doesn't have a lot of rocks, um, your cows hooves may get overgrown and may need to be trimmed. Um, and so that's something that some veterinarians offer or otherwise there are folks that travel and do it or you can learn to do it yourself. Uh, but for one cow, it's probably easier to find somebody who can do it for you most of the time. Um, and flies, cows attract flies. They're big, sweaty, smelly creatures. Um, <laughs> and we love them for all of those things, but the, the flies love them too. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of things topically that you can use that will help um, some of the essential oils and apple cider vinegar. Um, in particular, mint and lemon balm can help um, sort of keep the, cat, the cow free from flies, which can just drive them nuts. Um, and you want to make sure that if there's ever an injury or an area of the cow that is staying moist for some reason, like if you had a laceration on your cow and you were treating it, you want to always, always, always check for any parasite, any um, fly larva or eggs because they can get fly strike, which is a miserable thing um, and not something you want to go through. Um, and so just be aware of that if there's a situation that arises. Um, and I've talked about some of these already with the red flags, um, things to look for. Like I said, if your cow's off feed, if they're acting really different, if their temperature is too high, too low, um, change in milk quality, quantity, change in udder texture, um, color of the milk, or um, you know, if their udder is hard and hot, then that's something that you should take note of because that, that is definitely a sign that something is not right. Um, any respiratory symptoms, if you have discharge from the nose or the eyes or excessive drooling, um, those can all indicate respiratory issues in a cow. Um, again, the Harold's patches could be ringworm, um, a cow with diarrhea or any kind of lameness probably needs to have that evaluated and figure out what's causing those issues. Um, and cows can sometimes bloat. And so cows have a very complex digestive system. And a lot of what their digestive system does is ferment the, and bacteria ferments and degrades the the food that they're taking in. And when that balance gets thrown off by often fresh pasture or a totally different type of feed or sudden changes in feed, they can bloat. And that's just an accumulation of gas within the rumen or the digestive system of the cow. Um, and that is an emergency situation that has to be handled right away. And 
Um, a lot of people wonder if cows are bloated and in my, they'll send me a picture and ask, you know, is my cow bloated? I'm worried. And most of the time it's just that the cow went out and just ate and ate and ate until she couldn't eat anymore. And she's just as wide as a house and that's fine. Um, if a cow is bloated, she will be noticeably uncomfortable. Um, she'll probably have her back arched up. And if you tap on the side of her belly, it'll feel like a drum. The skin will be stretched really tight. It'll be really obvious that that's not a happy, comfortable cow. Um, so definitely something that needs emergency attention if it were to happen with your cow. And body snoring. So when we talk about cows, most people see dairy cows. And if you're not used to dairy cows, they don't have a lot of fat cover. They don't have a lot of flesh cover. There's a lot of bone and a lot of skin and not a lot of muscle to the cow um, in comparison to like your beef cows or your Labrador or um, you know any other animal that you might be familiar with in your normal life. And so learning how to assess your dairy cow's body condition is really, really important. Um, you know, we all generally like to see an animal with more weight on it than less weight because it makes us feel better, like we're feeding them better, right? Um, and with dairy cows, being overweight can be a really, really big risk. Um, you know, obviously we don't want emaciated cows, um, but with dairy cows, they've developed a very specific scoring system. And I, I think there's a link to that in the resources as well. If not, I'll make sure I add it real quick before we're done. Um, but there are a lot of resources out there, even if you just Google, but in the States, body condition scoring is done on a scale of one to five with cows, with one being basically emaciated and really skinny and in health crisis and five being an extremely obese cow that's probably going to have some significant health problems. Um, and so ideally, you know, we want to be in the two to four range and where the cow falls will depend on where she is in her production cycle. Um, you know, you can't just say, I want a body condition score of three and I want my cow to always be there because that's not how that works. Um, they produce a lot of milk, which is a huge tax on their body. Um, and they're designed to fluctuate between being, you know, a little bit more conditioned and a little bit less conditioned depending on what their needs are at that point. So with your young cows, um, from about six months old until the time that you breed that cow, you probably want her to be in the two to three range. You don't want her to get overweight before she's pregnant. Um, they can accumulate internal fat. It can be harder to breed them. They can produce less milk. Um, and there can be problems with calving with internal fat buildup. So um, be really careful if you do buy a young cow that you don't overfeed her because again, cows like to eat and it's fun to give them treats. And you know, a lot of folks will feed them too much and it, it won't help them in the long run. Um, about the time that she has her first calf, you want her to slowly have gotten a little bit more weight on her, more reserves on her. So she is about a three and a half. So falling right in between the three and the four score. Um, now in the first month of lactation, she's gonna lose condition. There's nothing you can do. Um, when cows start producing milk, it, they go into what's called a negative energy balance. And that means there is physically no way for them to take in as much energy as they're putting out in milk in that first 30 to 60 days. Um, and so that's why when they have their calf, you want them to be a little bit higher on the body score scale. And then she'll naturally come back down um, about a month after calving, you want her to be in the two and a half to three range. Um, she could lose two to 300 pounds in the first two months of lactation. Um, and, you know, for us, that's, that's enormous. But if you're talking, and, and even for a 1,200 or 1,300 pound cow, that's a lot of weight. Um, and it can take up to 25 weeks for them to gain back just one body score. Um, and fortunately, you have the whole lactation to build their body score back up before they start all over again. Um, so around the middle of their lactation period, you want them back around a three. Um, you know, they may drop down to two and a half. If it's a really high producing cow, she might be pushing a two. And so you adjust your nutrition and bring her back up to a point where she's putting on weight um, so that she's around a three in the middle of her lactation. And by the time you dry her off, she could be up to a three and a half or even a four. And that would be a good place for her to be um, at dry off and before she calves again. And that's about the same score where you want her when she calves. So <clears throat> their first calving, you want them a little bit more lean. And after that, for subsequent calves, they can be a little bit heavier, 
um, you know, in that three and a half to four range so that they have more reserves to pull on because they're second and later lactations, they'll produce more milk. And so they'll have an even bigger energy <laughs> demand. So um, learning how to evaluate your cow's body condition is really, really important. And learning about the adjustments that you can make to get your cow where she needs to be for her production cycle is extremely important if you're going to have a dairy cow. Um, you know, that said, most of the heritage breeds or lower production strains of cows that you might have as a homestead cow might not show as dramatic swings in body condition score. Um, but definitely aim for the middle of the scale, you know, a little higher before calving and a little lower after her peak production cycle around two months into lactation. Um, and that will help you maintain the health of your cow and um, will give you a really good insight into her health. So if you have a cow that is a body score of a three and everything's great and you think things are going really well and then one day you go out and you think hey she seems like she just you know dropped a whole body score overnight probably she didn't drink anything so when the cow gets dehydrated they can lose a body condition score almost overnight um, and some of it will bounce back quickly if you get the problem corrected um, but usually unexpected changes in your body's condition score indicate some kind of problem whether it's illness or parasite issues, or, you know, maybe your water got contaminated with something and she's not drinking it or something's happening that needs to be fixed to get her back on track. So breeding, like Christy mentioned, if you have a dairy cow and you want to have milk for more than one season, you're going to have to breed your cow. Um, there are different options when you're breeding. Um, sort of the simplest thing we think of is, you know, you find a bull, you get them together, you get a calf nine months later. Um, bulls are really big and they are ruled by testosterone. And in general, I would not recommend someone without really good facilities and really a lot of experience to be handling a bull or have one at your farm. Um, some folks that have a bull might let you bring your cow for a visit um, and breed her that way. Uh, most folks don't just for biosecurity reasons. And also if you bring your cow somewhere else and she's there for a few weeks, you're not any, any longer in control of what she's eating or how she's being cared for. And so you may not be comfortable bringing her to another farm and exposing her to different diseases or different management styles. Um, generally with dairy cows, most of them are bred with artificial insemination. Um, it's doesn't require two cows to ever see each other. Um, so there's no, no risk of disease transmission. Um, your cow can stay in the comfort of her stall. And, um, you know, there are the folks who think that, you know, it's, it's something that the cows might not appreciate. Um, but cows that are in heat want to be bred. Um, <laughs> they will stand to be bred. Um, and generally, you know, it's, it's a process that's very quick and very easy. And um, it does require some specialized equipment. It does require someone who knows what they're doing and, you know, is trained on how to inseminate a cow um, and has the proper tank for storage of semen and things like that. So there are very specific things. And generally the easiest thing to do is find um, an AI technician that's local to you that's willing to come breed your cow on the day that she's in heat. Um, sometimes local dairy farms are willing to AI for small homesteaders. It's really something you'd have to talk to a local farm near you and find out whether it's something they can do. Um, most cows, most dairy cows will start cycling around nine months, sometimes as late as 12 months, um, they'll start their heat cycles. And that's sort of when cows hit puberty, they probably should not be bred at that age. Um, and so, for production dairies, most of them breed around 15 months um, with a nine month gestation that puts her calving at about two years old. And that's sort of the gold standard for most dairy cattle. Some of your heritage breeds might take longer to mature and might not be ready to breed till they're two years old. And so going back to whether you buy a calf or an adult cow, if you bought, you know, a two day old, um, you know, a heritage breed cow and you have to raise her for two full years to breed her. Now she's on, she's two years and nine months old before you get your first drop of milk. Um, that can be a huge investment in time and feed and everything else to get her to that point. Um, and so you definitely need to balance that and decide what you want to do. Um, so their heat cycles, if a cow is not pregnant, 
once she hits puberty, she will come into heat every 21 days. And what that means is your cow is going to moo a lot. She's going to get what we call wild eyes where they kind of, you can see like the whites all the way around the eyes and they just look a little crazy. Um, they're going to move around a lot. They're going to go looking for a bull. Basically they might get out of your fence if it's not secure. Um, they may try to mount other cattle if you have other cattle. If you don't have other cattle, sometimes they'll try to mount other livestock that you might have. Sometimes they might try to mount you if you're not paying attention. Um, and so a cow in heat can be a dangerous thing just because they're so big. They're not being mean, but they're driven by their hormones at that point. And you need to be aware of that if you have a cow in heat. Um, you know, they have one thing on their minds for that like 12 hour period that they're in heat. <laughs> um, and so, like I said, every 21 days, um, in, then once they're pregnant, they go back to being their, your calm, docile cow and everything's fine. Um, well, after they calve, uh, they'll have about two months, sometimes a little less, but generally about two months where they don't cycle and then they'll start cycling again. Um, and so you need to make a decision about when you wanna breed your cow. In a production setting, most cows are rebred at about 60 days post calving. Um, you know, in a homesteader situation, you may not need to do that. Um, you can make adjustments based on what works for your timing um, within that, that window of when she's in heat every, every three weeks or so. Um, I just wanted to, um, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to mention where a couple of minutes from 1230, is it, is it okay if we go a little over, Paul? As, as long as you need. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I talked too much. <laughs> so a lot of information. Thank you. We'll try to maybe speed a little bit. All right. So I'll try to get through that. Um, sometimes you shouldn't breed your cow. Just if your cow is overweight or not healthy or calves and is a, is, has some sort of infection or something going on, you probably want to wait to breed her and get those things taken care of. So calving, cows are pregnant for nine months. Um, I'm going to sort of go through this pretty quickly because we, we are at the end, but you know, if, if anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box and we can talk about things, but um, you want to get familiar with your signs of labor. Um, you know, your cow that's going into labor is going to have specific signs that say she's coming into labor and she's going to, you're going to have a calf soon. Um, once she goes into labor within six to eight hours, you should see what we call nose and toes. So you should see the feet followed by the nose. Um, and sometimes it can take an hour, sometimes two hours for a first time heifer to have a calf. If it's taking longer than that, you probably want to call your vet because the cow could be having a calf that's too big or not presented correctly. Um, with cows, occasionally you get twins. And sometimes that can be a really good thing. Um, if you have twins that are a male female set of twins, um, you can end up with the female twin having testosterone affect her development during gestation. And she can actually end up being a free Martin and a sterile cow. So she's fine for beef. There's nothing you know, physically wrong with her, but she won't be able to be bred. Um, and so just something to keep in mind, if you do have twins, I would not plan on keeping the female for a breeding cow. Um, post calving care, I like to offer warm molasses water to my cows after they calve. It helps them sort of feel better fast. It gives them a little sugar rush, some warmth. Um, it helps them pass their afterbirth, it helps their milk sort of let down. Um, it's just kind of a nice thing to do for your cow. Um, you want to make sure that the afterbirth passes within 12 hours after you have your calf. And then just keep an eye on your cow for any signs of infection or, you know, any problems with her udder um, that might happen in that, that neonatal period and post calving period. And then you get a calf, right? <laughs> Everybody loves calves. They're super cute. Um, and they will suck on your entire arm if you let them. And, you know, they're, they're very adorable. Um, and they need special care. So a newborn calf needs to get colostrum. So it's always a good idea to have some sort of replacement colostrum on hand, whether it's frozen colostrum or artificial colostrum, just in case something happens with your cow and she doesn't produce colostrum for some reason, um, or she's sick and she doesn't produce anything for milk. Um, those things can happen. So it's always a good idea to have a backup plan for how you're going to get colostrum into your calf. That colostrum is essential for developing a competent immune system in your calf. It's going to pass vital antibodies onto that baby to keep them healthy. Um, 
And then you need to make a decision. Are you calf sharing? Are you letting her raise the calf? Are you putting it on a bottle? What, are you selling it? What, what's your plan with the calf? Um, a lot of homesteaders like to calf share. And so what that means is you leave the cow with the calf, usually for a week or so at the beginning, sometimes longer. And then at some point you start separating them overnight um, is generally the, the way that most people do it. And then you can milk the cow in the morning and then you can put them back together and the calf will get the milk for the rest of the day and will get more than enough than they need and you will get some to share as well. And so that can be really nice to share in that way. Um, and then everybody gets their needs met. Um, again, you do need to have a separate area to keep the calf if you're doing that where they can't access the udder because they will nurse and nurse and nurse till everything's gone if given the opportunity. Um, if you decide to bottle feed your calf, um, you have a choice between either milking your cow and feeding the calf that milk. Um, you can pasteurize that milk and feed it to your calf if you were to want to, um, or you can put them on um, an artificial replacer. Um, and a lot of folks will do that if they really want all of the milk for themselves. You can put the calf on a replacer. Um, I would definitely say if you're gonna do replacer, to use a whey-based replacer versus instead of a soy-based replacer. They'll digest it better, they'll be healthier overall, and they'll just do better. Um, it might be a little bit more expensive, but it's, it's worth the cost, in my opinion. Um, the biggest thing with bottle calves, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of things I could say, but the biggest thing I'll say is just less is always better with calves. Um, when you finish bottle feeding your calf, they should still be looking for more. Um, don't ever feed them to the point that they're not hungry because they probably will end up with digestive issues. Um, so always, you know, limit feed your calf if you're bottle feeding. Um, look at what the recommendations are for the specific breed that you have and try to stick to that pretty closely um, because overfeeding can be something that's, that can be really bad for your calf. Um, some breeds of cows are born with horn buds where they will grow horns. If you don't want horns, they can be disbudded as calves. Um, that's something that, you know, as a homesteader, you'll probably have your vet do because you're probably only doing one calf every year or two. Um, and it, it's pretty, pretty uneventful um, for the calf. Generally, the biggest thing that, that the calf has an issue with is being restrained, but it is something that, um, you know, most, most veterinarians will use a local block for so that it's not painful for the calf and then do a little bit of pain management after, which I think is really great. Um, you can castrate. So if you have a bull calf, you don't want him to stay a bull calf, um, I promise. Even as cute as he is and as great as his behavior is when he's little, he will at some point listen only to his testosterone and not to you anymore because that's what bulls do. Um, so I always recommend castrating your bull calf, um, no matter how pretty he is or how cute he is or how great you think he might be. Um, there's a lot of bulls out there. And again, most cows are bred with artificial insemination. So the need for bulls that are raised on smaller farms is very small in most cases. Um, you wanna probably vaccinate your calf. I would definitely recommend vaccinating with a vaccine that covers tetanus if you're doing any castrating or disbudding because you're creating an open wound that can invite tetanus. Um, there are other vaccines as well to consider, but that would be really a discussion for you and your vet, I think, to decide what's appropriate for your situation. Um, weaning is what we call the process of transitioning the calf from a milk-based diet to a solid diet. Um, and so weaning in a commercial setting generally happens about six weeks old. Um, in a natural environment, it would generally happen closer to six months old. Um, most folks who are bottle feeding sort of go somewhere in the middle and end up at about eight to 12 weeks where they wean their calf. And it should be a gradual weaning generally. Um, so you wanna reduce the amount you're feeding. If you're calf sharing, probably not as big a deal. Um, the downside is that when you wean a calf, a, a calf that's been nursing on its mother, they don't just stop nursing. <laughs> if the cow has milk and she lets the calf nurse, the calf will continue to nurse until they're a year old or two years old. They'll just keep nursing because there's, there's milk there. Um, and most of the time the cow won't really mind, you know, it's a social activity for them and, and they're okay with it. So if you want the milk, you're going to have to probably have a separate area for that calf if, if they've nursed their mother. Um, definitely I would recommend handling your calf, which you're probably going to do because they're so cute, right? And little, and we, we generally handle our babies a lot. Um, but halter training is really important. Your, your cute 40 pound baby is going to end up being a thousand or 1200 pounds in having that animal able to be led around with a halter 
simplifies everybody's life um, and definitely is something I would strongly recommend. Um, and then I guess the last consideration is what's your plan for the calf. And I think I mentioned that a little, but you know, if you're going to sell the calf, you know, you should have a plan for, you know, what the market is for that calf. If you're going to raise it for beef, um, you know, how are you going to keep it separate to the point where it's not nursing anymore? And, you know, just, just make a plan because you, you have created a calf now that I, I feel like we have a responsibility to make sure they end up in a situation that's good. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop talking and switch it back to Christy. Thanks, Sarah. I know that was such a long, important section. I appreciate you taking that over. Um, I'll just run through real quickly, you know, once your cow's in milk, what to do, how to, to handle that. Um, basically, you want to make sure that you're cleaning the udder. So you can do a special wash for that, but basically you just want to make sure that there's no dirt coming off the udder into your milk pail or running into the milk as you're milking. You can choose between hand milking or machine milking. I really love hand milking. It's a nice quiet bonding activity. Um, great way to start and end my day. Um, and as you can see, my daughter helps out sometimes too. So the whole family can chip in. It does take a lot of hand strength though. I think even when I first got um, my first dairy cow from Sarah, I called her and said, how do you do this? My hands hurt so much. <laughs> and with a cow, it's like four goats put together. So it's, uh, it is a process and you do need to milk them right away after they calf. So um, either have someone to help you take turns or you're just going to have to push through because that cow does need to be milked out. Um, stainless steel is always important because it's able to be sanitized. You want to keep your milk clean and cold at all times whenever possible. Um, training your cow, you can see in this picture, um, shines in a stanchion, so just a headlock, and that keeps her head still and the rest of her body follows. Um, sometimes cows will kick if they're uncomfortable in the beginning. I recommend just hanging on and getting it done. <laughs> if cows learn that they can kick you out of the way, that's a really tricky skill that they have forevermore. Um, so you want to do the best you can to teach them that that's not going to get you to stop. Um, there are things you can do like a belly band um, or tying their legs off to make sure that they stay still while they're getting used to you milking from them. Uh, once they are used to that, usually it's not a problem. They should be milked probably three times a day, the first day that they calve, um, just to make sure that you're getting that udder used to being emptied. Uh, the calf won't, if, even if you're calf sharing, the calf will not drink uh, that much milk the first few days. So you definitely need to be the one to keep her milk flowing. Um, after that, twice a day, every 12 hours is typical what you're gonna do for milking unless you're calf sharing. Um, and then the calf can empty them uh, as much as you like them to. I, I like to milk in the morning after they've been separated at night and then they go back together um, throughout the day the calf nurses until they come back in for the evening. And I don't have to milk at night because she's empty. Um, length of lactation, I think Sarah mentioned, but um, typically you can breed your cow after 60 days of having a calf when they start coming back into heat. Sometimes if they are nursing a calf, they won't come back into heat for quite a while. Um, so you can watch that. And if it's a homestead cow, you probably aren't too sad about that because they're just gonna keep on making milk. Um, so it can, they can stay in milk for even a couple of years without being bred um, in some cases. Drying off, um, they should be dried off at least 60 days before they calf again. So if your calf is due in a couple months, you just slowly stop milking. Um, some cows will naturally dry off as their body uses more energy to grow the calf inside them that last trimester. Um, really high production cows need some help with that. Like we said, keep your, your milk cold and clean. Um, the faster you can get it down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the better. So it's recommended that you either put your jar in an ice bath and filter your milk into the jar and get it really cold. If you agitate it, it will get colder faster. Some people put it in the freezer for a short time. 
um, I'm too scared, I'll forget it in the freezer and it'll blow up. So <laughs> milk, uh, the ice bath is the best way that I found uh, in your homestead kitchen to get it nice and cold. Um, you do need to strain the milk. I was surprised at that when I first started um, that you should strain your milk through a milk filter um, because there might be little bits of debris or hair that have fallen into the milk that you don't see and that's not pleasant to drink or to let stew in your milk in the refrigerator. Um, my cow makes about four gallons a day so I take two gallons in the morning the calf gets the other two gallons throughout the day. Um, some cows will make more than that, it depends a lot on their breed, their diet, um, their genetics, but that's a, a, probably an average for a homestead cow. And all that good stuff you can do with milk. Um, I am teaching another workshop on Monday on how to make mozzarella, which is one of the primary things I do with my milk. I recently wrote an article for NOFMS on um, how to make butter. So you can look that up too, um, but all kinds of good stuff. And if you still have extra, give it to those pigs and help you grow some more food for your family. All right, so if there's time for questions, we're happy to take them. Um, otherwise we have our contact information in the program book, I think too. Great. Well, thank you, Christy, and thank you, Sarah, so much. Um, I definitely got the inspiration to want to own a cow, but I also got a healthy sense of respect for the amount of work and details that go into owning a cow. So, um, but one thing that I really took away was your both of you um, have a real love for your cows and your animals, and I think they really are are part of your family, and that that really showed during your presentation. So. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And if any of our participants do want to unmute themselves and ask a question, we can we can take a few more minutes here and then we'll we'll end the session. Sarah in the chat said, thanks. I know now that this is something I'm not going to tackle. And <laughs> You know, that's as important as uh, learning what you do want to do. There's definitely a lot involved in cow. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something that we all think of as, you know, I'll just have this cow and I'll milk her and everything will be easy. And um, sometimes it's easier to find someone who's doing a really good job and support them. I know there, there was a question from uh, Lucy who I know outside of the session asking how I continuously breed my cow for milk. Um, I do use AI. So uh, someone comes with a straw, breeds her for me when it's time. Um, and we don't need to worry about transporting her to a bull or finding anyone else. Okay, well, I did put an evaluation link in the chat as well, as well as the um, links to our um, virtual vendor marketplace and our auction. Um, so feel free to check those out. Lots uh, more workshops this afternoon, uh, keynote tonight, and then more workshops tomorrow and the evening of all next week. So thank you for attending this workshop and we look forward to seeing you uh, throughout the week. And thanks again, Christy and Sarah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.